You know what? Um, this is week number five in the series called All In. And the whole point about this series of All In is that we want to go after life, a life of love, just as if our life depended on it. You know why? Because it does. You know, if we could embrace this concept of love the way that God has taught it, the way that God expects it, we would find out that our lives would change in an incredible, an incredible way. But we have to be willing to put ourselves out there. And the, what I would ask you to do is to love generously because this is the key to great relationships. If you remember in week number one, I shared with you uh, about the five love languages. If you haven't taken that survey yet, you are doing yourself a disservice and you certainly are doing those that surround you that are in different relationships a disservice because learning what your love language is and learning what those around you, what their love language is, will help you improve your relationships. And then in week two, I talked about uh, why is love important? And it, we find this in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13 in the first three verses. And basically it says no matter what you accomplish, no matter what you become, no matter how eloquent you are in speech, no matter how successful you are by the world's standards, if we don't have love, it's worthless. We're a failure. We're really bankrupt. And then the next week I went through the rest of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 where it described what love looks like. And I think if all of us would take that inventory, we'd realize we come up short in many areas of what love should look like in our lives. And then last week, I hope you enjoyed it when I talked about love does and how that uh, a tale of two friendships. I shared with you about Randy and Bob Goff and what an incredible story that he shared with us. And then I shared with you about uh, Jonathan and David and how that Jonathan, who was the son of the king, gave and honored and loved on David, who was going to be the eventual king, Took, will be, would be taking his place on the throne. Well, this week in week number five, I want to share with you the concept of love God and love people. Now, this is not something novel to myself. It's not like I thought of this. Um, I actually found this in Scripture. So if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you, open up to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 22. And I'm going to um, read a couple verses there for you. Matthew chapter 22. And I'm going to start and read verse 36. And verse 36 says these words, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Now, I want you to know, while... Um, this question came to them by lawyers to Jesus. They're trying to trip Jesus up because uh, there could be no right answer in their eyes because whatever he picked as the greatest commandment, they would point out, well, is that greater than this one over here? And Jesus, because he uh, was Jesus, because he was all-knowing, he gave them an answer that they did not expect. And we find this in verse 37. And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart." with all your soul, and with all your mind. And so as I ask you to love God, I want us to follow this principle here in Matthew 22, verses 36 and 37. And when I hear uh, love God with all our heart, I hear treasure, and I'll show that to you. And when I hear with all our soul, I, I hear talent. Of, it's who we are. And with all our mind, it's our time because I think that we all recognize that it's easy for us to get lost in our thoughts. And we spend, uh, husbands, uh, men, I I'm, I'm going to rat us out, all right? Because here's typically what happens. We're driving down the road with our wives sitting beside us. And when we do that, um, they look over to us inevitably and they say, honey, what are you thinking? And every guy across the planet gives the same answer. Nothing. 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 Now, they know we're lying. If, if they could hook us up to an EKG, they would see there's brain waves going on. We're thinking thoughts. And we spend a lot of time 
thinking thoughts. And so as we think about how can we love God, I want to give you three very easy points, easy um, answers that can you can hold on to and, and walk through the week and concentrate on this. And the first is with our time. But you see, the reality is this, that time is not unlimited. True, it's short, but it's not unlimited. You'll fi find this out when just when you think that um, something is going, for example, I'm about to go over to Afghanistan, I'm going to be over there, uh, I'm going to a four-month school, been going for six months, and everybody kept saying it's just six months. You know what? That, that seemed good for them, but for me, that seemed like an eternity. And to be honest, the first two weeks was long. And then at some point, the time started going by faster. And, and that last day when I got to get on the plane and head back to America was an incredible time. But I'm here to tell you that while that, that six months seemed like forever, it was limited. It was really a very short amount of time. You know, Jesus addressed this to his disciples in John chapter 4 when he said, say not that there are yet four months into the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, the harvest is right now. And here's what I want to encourage you when you try to love God. Don't wait until tomorrow. Don't wait until next week. Don't wait until next month. And please don't wait until COVID's over and 2021 is here. We need to love God right now, today. And a good example of this is to realize that when we measure time, it's not in minutes, it's not in hours, it's not in months. The way that we should be measuring our time is in opportunities. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus shared two parables. The first parable was of the ten virgins. And when you read the story, you think that it's about lamps and oil, but it's not. It's about an opportunity to be with the king. And then he shared another story about talents that he'd given to three of his servants. And you would think that that story was about what did they do with the talents? And that's not the case because what it was really about was the opportunities that some of them took advantage of and many of them hid from. And the reality is that we need to ask ourselves that same question. Are we using our time? See, time does not belong to us, but to God. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 7 says this, I have fought a good fight. Do you know that fights are measured in rounds? Uh, if you're married, you know what I'm talking about. There's a round on Monday and then a round on Tuesday and then a round. And then you, on Friday, there's three or four rounds all squeezed into one day. Well, there's a time limit on each of those rounds. And then he says, I've finished my course. Uh, do you know that uh, with each course, there is a certain length and there's a time that you're going after. Hebrews 12.1 says these words, let us run with endurance the race. I'm going to change that word. Let us run with endurance the purpose for your life that is set before you. All of us have a purpose. It doesn't matter how young you are or how old you think you are. You if you've got a pulse, if you're breathing, you have a purpose, and God wants you to live out that purpose. And so the first thing that we should remember is to love God with our time. The second easy thing to remember is that we should love God with our talent. So how exactly does God want us to use our talents for him? Well, I believe it's this. God wants us to build his kingdom for his glory. That's what we should be doing with our talents you see, God made all of us different. Each of us brings a different set of skills. In 1 Corinthians in chapter 12, Paul tells us about, he uses the example that the church is a body, like a human body. We each have different parts and each of us should be doing something different based on the part or based on our talents, based on our skills. And when we do this, it should be pointing back and glorifying God. So in other words, God wants you to use your unique role in the body of Christ to glorify him. So if God made you an amazing singer like we just saw up here, you should be up here singing. 
If God gave you ability with musical instruments, you should be using those musical instruments to glorify God. If God gave you the ability to work with children and have patience that many of us don't know about, um, like right now, there are many volunteers that are investing in our children in Kids Quest. Whatever the talent God has given you, whatever the desire that he's placed in your heart, you should use it. To glorify God. Each of us today should be thinking about every moment, every day that we wake up is how can we use our God-given abilities to glorify God. How can we use our God-given abilities to reach those who don't know him or who, far, who are far from God and bring them into a relationship with him? Well, not only should we use our time and our talent, but the, the one that nobody wants to hear, we should use our treasure. Most pastors get beat up. You, you talk about giving too much. And here's what I would tell you is that... Uh, our ability, desire, effectiveness in giving is a heart issue, not a wallet issue. And so when I talk about treasure, what is your treasure? Well, the Bible tells us in Matthew 6, 21, and Jesus said these words, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And if you listen and, and what Jesus said many times, he is more concerned with our heart than anything else. So I just want you to know that you can love God with money. You can love God with abilities. And if it doesn't come from the right heart, it's not even loving God. It just looks like it on the outside. If you would, open up your Bibles to 2 Corinthians in chapter 8. And I want to read something to you. You see... The God that we all serve, the God that we are here today to celebrate, the God that sent his only begotten son to die for us is a God of generosity. He's a God of charity, not of greed and trying to pull and take from those in need. And so Paul relays a story in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And I'm just going to read verses 1 through 8. And it says these words, We want you to know, brothers about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. And if you get nothing else today, I want you to understand that every one of us in the, that, that can hear my voice, everyone that's watching this, we all have experienced God's grace in our lives. Some of us have embraced it, and some of us are still running from it. And so here, this group of Macedonia experienced God's grace. In verse 2, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. It, it, it doesn't make sense. The church at Macedonia was poor. They were in poverty. And, and the definition of poverty that Paul was writing about is different than the definition of poverty that we have today. Poverty today is that, that you barely have enough money to get to the end of the month. We think that's poverty. Poverty in Paul's day was they, might, they didn't know what they were going to eat tomorrow. In verse 3 it says, they, For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. You know what that means? Paul saw them giving, and he said, look, you need to keep that money. And they begged Paul, let us be a part in this. And this is not as we expected in verse 5. But they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Verse 6, accordingly we urge Titus, that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you. This is the church of Corinth. This was a very worldly church. The Macedonian church was one of poverty. The one in Corinth was one of wealth and splendor. 
The Macedonian church was one that they didn't know where the next meal was coming from. The Corinthian church, they were like us and they threw more food away at the end of the week than the church in Macedonia probably consumed. And he finishes verse 7 with these words, See that you excel in this act of grace also. In verse 8, and this is the one I want you to, to stay with, it says, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is also genuine. And, and I'm here to tell you that God has been good and gracious to Temple Baptist Church. And, and I boldly ask you to support the church. I boldly ask you to respond and love God with your time, your talent, and your treasure. Why do I do that? So that we can make a difference in guys' lives named Brandon McGinnis. Who else in Centralia needs to reach out and have a church that's waiting to re receive them with open arms? Who else needs to walk through those doors and experience the Holy Spirit's conviction and when they get home, fall on their knees and repent of their sins? I dare say that there are thousands outside of these walls. That's why we need to love God with our time, our talent, and our treasure. You see, loving God should be easy. Why? 1 John 1.19 says these very simple words. We love Him because He first loved us. When, when someone loves you, it should be easy. But I, I bet you would testify that sometimes our ability to love God back, even though it should be easy, we make it difficult. We struggle. We allow things to get in the way. We don't give Him our time. We don't give Him our talents. And we hold on to our treasure. Well, he doesn't stop there at loving God. In Matthew 22 and verse 38, he says these words. This is the great and first commandment, to love God. But he combines them and he makes these two inseparable. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see, loving God is easy. Loving people, not so much. Bob Goff, he... Uh, has a great saying, he wrote a book, it says, love everybody always. They came to Jesus and they asked him, well, who's my neighbor? And, and the story that he told them was not the story they wanted to hear. That's not the example of a neighbor that they wanted to hear about. See, we think that who's my neighbor? Is it the person sitting beside me in the, in the pew? Is it the people that I like that I, I encounter throughout the week? And Jesus said, no, it's the people that you despise. Those are your neighbors. When God brings you in contact, it's time for you to use your time, your talent, and your treasure. Romans 13.10 says these words, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of all the law. And what the law reveals to us is that, that we can't get it done. Matter of fact, the law gives us an example of an unattainable truth. And yet it's that unattainable truth that we are able to attain because of an undeserved grace. The same grace that Paul was talking about to the church in Corinth. And so how should we love people the same way that we love God? With our time, with our talent, and with our treasure. But I want to change things up because if you remember in the dysfunctional series, I talked about this word honor. And really honor was just an active way to love people. And so what I want to do is I want to change each of these and take you back to that series in Dysfunctional and how that we honor people. And the first way that we honor people is that we love them by leveraging our power. Because time is power. I know you've heard money is power. I know you've heard knowledge is power. But I'm here to share with you that your time is power. Matter of fact, time is the great equalizer. Many of us struggle with time management. And, and what it is, is we're not struggling with time itself. We're struggling with what we fill our time with. 
How many people, when COVID happened, when you were told you can't go to work, when you're told you can't leave your homes, when you're told you've got to stay right there, how many people follow through on the commitments that you made to yourself? You know what, if I can't leave my home and I don't have to go and do all these other things, I'm going to read my Bible more than I've ever read my Bible before. And then we did. And we told ourselves, I'm going to pray like I've never prayed before. And our knees aren't hurting. You see, time is the great equalizer. There's a concept out there. It's called the rule of 168. And that, that means that there's 168 total number of hours in each and every week. All of us, no matter how wealthy you are, or no matter how much poverty that you live in, every one of us have 168 hours every week. No more and no less. And the key for us based on what Stephen Covey says, is to not spend our time, but to invest our time. You see, you can spend your time on useless and on useful things, but when you start thinking about your time as investing it, it changes everything. You see, time is free, but it's priceless. Time is the one thing when you run out of that you're going to want just a little bit more of. How do we love people? We love them by leveraging our power. We love them with time. The one thing that we all have. Not only do we leverage our power, but we love people by loving them with our talent. How do we love, le love them with our talent? Well, we leverage our influence. We leverage what we're good at. We leverage what we have the ability in. You see, I, I mentioned earlier that there, how could we love God with our uh, talent, and I shared with you by building his kingdom, but when it comes to loving people, we can do this by blessing others. First Peter 4.10 says these words, as each of you have received the gift, use it to serve one another. In Genesis 12, these words were spoken to Abraham. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make you your name great, so that you will be a blessing. And so when you look at your community, when I look at the greater Centralia area, I'm confident that there are needs out there. As a matter of fact, just a few weeks ago, eight people from our church invested in a mission. We went into a home that was, you want to talk about poverty. Carrie and I went into that home, and when we got back into the truck, my heart was broken. And I told Carrie, I said, let's order pizza for this family. She goes, I did that last night. I said, let's go to the grocery store and fill up a cart and, and bring them food. And so that's what we did. But we didn't stop there. We challenged some around us in the church. And so eight of us invested in a, six hours in one day. And so we were going in there and, and helping them, help them, them hook up a washer and a dryer that was challenging. We went in there and we helped them move things around and, and we hired a, a local carpet cleaning company to come in and clean the carpets. And what was interesting was when it was all said and done and I walked up to the carpet cleaner and I, and I went to pay, he said, no, he goes, I want to be a part of this mission. And so Dave's carpet cleaning came out there and invested his time and his talent and wouldn't take a penny for it. See, that's how we love people. Not only that, but seven other church members spent all that morning doing, one used his talent with electricity because when we plugged in the, the washer, it wouldn't work. Went and bought a new part for it, it worked. So we saw that morning time and talent invested and we saw a family. We saw six little kids have their life changed. And I'm here to tell you that if you look around 
and you don't find a ministry here in this church that's reaching out that you can be a part of, I bet if you just look around close to you, you'll find that there's a ministry that needs to be started. So we can leverage our power and love people. We can leverage our influence and love people. And the last thing, we can leverage our resources and love people. 1 John 3 and 17 and 18 say these words, If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions. Church, I want to pastor a group of people who want to love with actions, not just words. I, I love hearing the phrase, I love you. I love saying the phrase, I love you. But those are, are worthless if our actions don't follow through on that. And we should be like the church in Macedonia and that we should give within our means and above our means. And what you'll find out is that the creator of this world will take that and invest it. And, and how he turns around and blesses you, I can't explain it. You know, God's economy, it's very different than man's economy. We think that we put money in and we'll get money out. Sometimes in God's economy, you put money in and you get uh, health. You get blessings to a family member. You see a career take off that you thought wasn't going to. God's economy is incredible. So the challenge for us is to love God with our time, our talent, and our resources. And then the, the, the double challenge is to love people with our time, with our talents, and with our resources. And if you recall, each week I've been sharing with you one of the five love languages. And today I want to share with you the love language of gifts. Some people that when you give them a gift, my mom was one of these, that when you give her a gift, her eyes would light up. And I want to share with you a gift that we all have experienced or can experience. And it comes from Romans chapter 15 and verse 7. Romans 15, 7 says these words, Accept one another just as Christ accepted you. You see, that's the gift that all of us have been giving is the acceptance of God, the Creator, through Jesus Christ. And why have we been accepted it says it at the end, in order to bring praise to God. And so when you have the ability to accept those that are, are doing you wrong, when you have the ability to accept those that are um, trying to hurt you, trying to despitefully use you, trying to say words against you, when you accept them, you're Christ-like. Because it's easy to throw back words when someone throws hateful words at you. It's easy to throw back some deeds when someone has malice intent towards you. It's hard to accept them. Why do we do this? Because God, for what Christ did, accepts us. You see, God asks us not to do anything that Jesus Christ himself not only was capable of doing, but actually did. And the last passage I want to read to you is in Colossians in chapter 3, just three quick verses I want to read to you. And they, they, these are the words. Colossians 3 and verses 12 through 14. It says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. See, that's the way God sees you, as holy and beloved. Put on then compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, beginning with one another, and if one has a complaint against the other, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. Verse 14, and above all these, put on, what's that word? Love. And above all these, put on love. Why? Because it binds everything together in perfect harmony. Why is it so hard for us to love? And, and why is it hard for us to love generously? 
To, to love beyond whatever love we're receiving from other people. To give love where hate and, and, and ridicule come to us instead. I believe the reason why we struggle with loving generously is because of fear. And the Bible tells us that perfect love casts out fear. And if you could learn to love generously, even in the face of those who are not returning that love to you, you could overcome your fear of failure. The fear that the love that you give them is not going to be enough. Or you can overcome the fear of rejection that is real. But you see, our great example, Jesus Christ, was rejected. And all he did was heal the sick. Make the lame walk again. Help the blind to see. Help those with leprosy to have perfectly clean skin. And he was rejected. So we have a choice. Are we going to love generously? Or are we going to allow fear? Are we going to allow the, the worry and the anxiety that, you know what, it might not be received? Jesus didn't care. He left his throne in heaven, even knowing that there were going to be those that would reject him. What are you willing to do in the name of love, even though you know that people are going to reject you? Family members are going to despitefully use you. See, we need to learn to love God and to love people. We need to learn to leave religion and to step into a relationship. Uh, it's, it's easy for us to talk religion and, and talk about religion and, and talk about the great things about religion. And, and there are many great things that religion has brought into this world. But I'm here to tell you that it's not about religion, it's about a relationship. Do this for me. Everybody right now, if you would just bow your head and close your eyes and, and listen to the words I'm about to say. I'm going to ask you just two simple questions. And the first question I have here for you today is this. Who in here longs for a better relationship? It may be multiple people in your life. It may be one certain person. Raise your hand tall so I can see this. Keep your hand up and just listen. Are you struggling to love them the way that Christ loved you? Are you struggling to love them in a way that seems like it's impossible? If so, receive this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just ask that you will see the, the hearts that are attached to every one of these hands. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would reassure them that the love that they live out generously will be received by you no matter what happens here on earth. And put your hands down and keeping your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Maybe you're here today and you heard this word religion and, and you thought that that's why I should be here in this church, but you realized that what you really need is a relationship with God. If that's you today, would you raise your hand and raise it tall so I can pray with you and for you? God, Lord, you see the, the hands that are here right now. God, more importantly, you see the hearts. And God, I ask that you would just make yourself real. God, that you would reveal what you did through Jesus Christ on Calvary. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would lead them into a relationship with you. In Jesus' name I pray.